Good morning. It is really with a great deal of pleasure that I'm here to introduce Malik Akini to all of you. I'm sure some of you already know Malik, but um, I actually have met Malik only once. He was the, the keynote speaker at the second annual Urban Agricultural Conference in Massachusetts while I was there serving as Commissioner of Agriculture. He obviously left quite an impression. He was, wild, he was the wildly unanimous choice of a group of city farmers, young city farmers, who had paid a visit to the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and farm in Detroit, and they were inspired and deeply touched by what they saw in conversations with Malik. They told me that he reminded them of Mel King. Mel King was a black legislator in, in Massachusetts in the, in the early 1970s, was the only black member of the state legislature. And he was the strongest advocate for agriculture within the legislature. And at one point, he was making a point about uh, er, uh, agriculture and the need to support our farmers in Massachusetts. And one of the white legislators looked at him and said, you're, you're not a farmer. Why are you so fired up and, 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 and excited about agriculture? And Mel, who was dressed in his dashiki, and looked at him and said, because I eat. <laughs> Malik is a fiercely eloquent advocate for urban agriculture who is not afraid to walk audiences through some uncomfortable places at time when necessary. He called attention during our conference on how well-meaning individuals and organizations can actually undermine urban agriculture's potential to empower communities of color to address injustices and inequality. Urban agriculture is simply too important to become the latest environmental justice fad whose directions are dictated by folks who do not live in the communities where they operate. He reminded of us back then. I'm convinced that he didn't know what he was going to say, what his message was to us when he uh, first entered the auditorium. I think he had to take a, take a little bit of time to see and chat with some of the folks in the audience to uh, take a look around, and I think most importantly, and I think this is true, and I haven't verified this with Malik, I think he had to get sense the vibes in the place before he knew what he was going to say, and I think that is his, his MO. That's one of the things that makes him such an extraordinary leader and teacher, unpredictable, and, and really sort of uses his intuition to determine what the message is going to be when, when he speaks. Malik is dedicated to working towards identifying and alleviating the impact of racism and white privilege on the food system and contributing to the development of an international food sovereignty movement. And, and food sovereignty usually knows different from food security. Food sovereignty means that the communities themselves will have a say in determining what that system is, is going to be. He is a founder and executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network which operates a seven-acre farm in Detroit. Along with the Detroit Black uh, Community Food System Network, he spearheaded efforts to establish the Detroit Food Policy Council, which he also chaired. Malik is a member of the Michigan Food Policy Council and serves on the steering committee uh, of undoing racism in the Detroit food system. From 1990 to 2011, he was executive director of the Inseroma Institute um, Public School Academy, one of Detroit's leading African-centered schools. Malik was named Administrator of the Year by the Michigan Association of Public School Systems uh, and served on the Board of Directors of Timbuktu Academy of Science and Technology from 2004 to 2011. He is also CEO of Black Star Educational Management. Don't know what he does in spare time. Malik is a 2015 James Beard Leadership Award recipient. He is also featured in the book, Blacks Living Green, and the movie, Urban Roots. He recently accepted my invitation to serve uh, as an advisor to the Cuba U.S. Agroecology Network, and it is a privilege for me to introduce him to you. Malik. Good morning, Bioneers. 
It's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you so much, Greg. Sometimes when I listen to those long introductions, I say, who, who are they talking about? <laughs> so whenever I have a chance to speak publicly, I always begin by giving uh, praise to the Creator. And I don't try to impose my spiritual beliefs on others, but for me, the work that I do is a spiritual work. And so I always begin with that. And also, I have to always recognize my ancestors, those that African American people share collectively, and also those who are in my personal bloodline, uh, who serve as a continual inspiration to me. I bring you greetings from Detroit. Detroit is often in the news. Uh, all right, D-Town. Detroit is often in the news, uh, usually not about very good things, but I have to tell you there's some really, really good things happening in Detroit uh, in spite of the government, not because of the government. Uh, and I bring you greetings specifically from the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, the organization that I have the honor to serve as executive director of. I also want to give a shout out to all the amazing activists in the city of Detroit who are redefining what our city is and redefining what a just society can be and working for a healthy planet. I also want to say that I stand in complete solidarity with the people, young people primarily throughout this country, who for the last few years have been declaring that black lives matter. So I've been an activist for all of my adult life uh, in Detroit's African-American community. And over the last 15 years or so, I've developed an intense interest in food, including where and by whom it's produced, who profits from its sale, how its consumption impacts the health of communities. I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts about the current food system and hope to energize and motivate you to work to create a just food system that meets everyone's needs. The United States, as you know, is one of the wealthiest nations in the world and produces huge amounts of food, much of which is exported throughout the world. But ironically, the United States also imports huge amounts of food from other countries. However, the mechanisms for producing, processing, distributing, and selling that food, are what is commonly known as the industrial food system, causes great harm to the environment and contributes to poor human health, promotes inequitable access to high quality food, and concentrates ownership and control in the hands of a few. The style of agriculture developed in post-World War II America relies heavily on chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Those chemicals often leach into groundwater that empties into streams, rivers, and lakes. This agricultural runoff is a prime cause for the algae bloom that compromised Toledo's drinking water last year. Use of heavy machinery and farming methods that do not replenish the soil are resulting in the loss of topsoil at more than 10 times the rate that nature can replace it. The transportation of food hundreds and even thousands of miles from its point of production contrib contributes to high levels of carbon in the atmosphere. What is sometimes called the standard American diet <laughs> which promotes the consumption of highly processed convenience foods and excessive amounts of refined sugars, meat and dairy is responsible for high rates of childhood and adult obesity, diabetes and heart disease. Those diseases appear more frequently in communities that lack abundant access to healthy food options. There are many intersecting factors that cause inequitable access to high quality food in America, including geography and economic class, but one of the huge factors is racism. There continues to be a global system of white supremacy that gives favor and unearned privilege to people who are identified as white. It makes white people the norm and marginalizes the experiences of people of African descent and other people of color. It creates structural barriers to equity. A good definition of white supremacy appears in the Dismantling Racism Workbook 
published by a group called DR Works. They say white supremacy is the idea that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. And let me just say that Greg was right. I do try to feel the vibe in the room. <laughs> but today, because I'm trying to say so much in a short time period, I'm actually operating from a script. So I'm going to try to stay on script. The global system of white supremacy is anchored in a worldview that suggests that white people are the best thing since sliced bread. This Eurocentric worldview causes people throughout the world to be falsely taught that Greece and Rome are the fountainheads of human civilization, that classical culture is synonymous with Western culture, and that the person that we've been taught to call Jesus, Mary, and presumably God are all white. In much of the world, we continue to name the days of the week after ancient European deities just such as Woden and Thor. Let's be clear, race is not a scientific reality. Race is a social and political construct. It has at various times been bolstered by pseudoscience, religion, and the military. The concept of racial identity has evolved throughout the history of the United States. An early American definition of whiteness was that an individual did not have one drop of black or Native American blood. Conversely, 19th century Southern law determined that one drop of black blood made you a so-called Negro. Even though race is not a scientific reality, as a social construct, it continues to impact every major institution and system in American life, including the food system. If it's true that land is the basis of power, then land ownership in America tells a profound story about race and power. In 1910, Blacks owned 15 million acres of farmland. By 1992, that number had dropped to 2 million acres. According to the USDA's Agricultural Economics and Land Ownership Survey of 1999, of all private agricultural lands in the United States, whites owned a whopping 98%. Blacks, Native Americans, Latinos, and Asians collectively own about 2%. <clears throat> One of the issues that I'm particularly passionate about is the almost colonial style extraction of wealth from black communities. Food is one of the foundational building blocks of a healthy economy. The economic potential of black communities continues to be siphoned off either by African Americans leaving our communities to gain access to stores selling high quality food or by spending money in our own neighborhoods with merchants who don't live there or invest in the well-being of the community. Malcolm X spoke to this 50 years ago in his famous speech, The Ballot or the Bullet, delivered in Detroit. Malcolm said, quote, even when we try to spend our money in the block where we live or the area where we live, we're spending it with a man who, when the sun goes down, takes that basket full of money in another part of town, end quote. Well, what about workers in the food system? The report, The Color of Food, published in 2011 by the Applied Research Center, revealed that people of color make less than whites throughout the food chain, including in production, processing, retail, service, and distribution. People of color tend to be concentrated in low-wage jobs and hold few management positions in the food system. Access to high-quality food is limited in many black communities throughout the United States. In my hometown, Detroit, with a population of roughly 700,000, the only national chain grocery store in the 140-square-mile city is the Whole Foods Market that opened two years ago in the most highly gentrified part of the city. It is the only national chain grocery in Detroit since Farmer Jack closed their last Detroit stores in 2007. According to the F Fair Food Network, and Orrin Heston is either here or will be here later today, and I encourage you to meet him. According to the Fair Food Network, there are 10 grocery stores for every 100,000 people in Detroit. 
In nearby Ann Arbor, the home of the University of Michigan, there are more than twice that number. Of the 70 or so independently owned grocery stores in Detroit, far too many sell inferior quality produce and lack other healthy food options. Even in the burgeoning food movement that seeks to create a more just food system, we see racism rearing its ugly head. Far too often, well-funded, white-led nonprofits come into black and Latino communities to plant gardens, teach cooking or nutrition, or to lead food justice efforts. While on the surface, such efforts may appear noble, these groups far too often approach their work like missionaries, assuming that they know best what's, what's best for the communities in which they work. The thing about the system of white supremacy is that it's so entrenched in the fabric of American society that we all unwittingly play into it even when we have good intentions. None of us escapes the impact of the system of white supremacy. Black people and other people of color are afflicted with what is called internalized racial oppression. Because of centuries of messaging and actions that suggest that our history culture and even our bodies have little value, we often have a diminished view of ourselves that impedes our ability to collectively address the problems facing our community. Both those who identify as white and those who identify as black or other people of color have work to do to rid ourselves of these antiquated notions that continue to dominate the deepest parts of our minds. So, So what must be done to create a food system that's an example of the racial justice and equity that we envision in the society that we strive to bring into being? A good first step is acknowledging and intentionally working against the system of white supremacy. This includes doing the personal transformative work to rid ourselves of the false concepts that we have internalized. This work is most effectively done by meeting regularly in caucuses where whites study support and hold each other accountable for ridding themselves of concepts of superiority, and blacks and other people of color study, support, and hold each other accountable for ridding ourselves of concepts of inferiority. It also includes working to change the institutional policies and practices that uphold systemic racism. The imposition of emergency managers in the state of Michigan have tremendous racial implications. Debates about federal immigration policies are highly racially charged. The, uh, the courageous young activists throughout this country have recently focused the world's attention on policies and practices that criminalize black youth. Both types of work, personal transformation and working for broader systemic change, are greatly aided by participating in in-depth, multi-day anti-racism trainings. Anti-racist trainings are not the same as diversity training or cultural sensitivity training. Anti-racist trainings seek to fundamentally challenge a deep-rooted system of oppression. There are groups throughout the country that do an excellent job at these trainings and help us gain a better understanding about the concept of whiteness and how it intersects with class and power. The ideas driving the food movement have gained tremendous traction over the past decade. Each month there are dozens of conferences, workshops, and forums throughout the country focusing on urban agriculture, food policy, healthy food, and or nutrition. Conversations and actions addressing racial equity should be an integral part of each of those food gatherings. <clears throat> Social justice organizations, community empowerment institutions, and thought leaders have the tremendous responsibility of developing and implementing strategies to identify, lift up, and support people of color leading grassroots food security and food justice efforts throughout this country. Organizations and institutions doing work to create a just food system should redouble their efforts to hire African Americans and other people of color, particularly in executive positions, and to appoint people of color to their boards. It's imperative 
that those who are most impacted by food insecurity and food injustice have agency, the agency to change the conditions in their communities rather than being subjects that are acted upon by others. Funders have a tremendous role to play, and this is a slide from uh, Gail Christopher, the vice president of the Kellogg Foundation. Funders have a tremendous role to play. They should require that nonprofits receiving funding adopt and use a racial equity lens in all aspects of their work, including adopting community engagement strategies that acknowledge existing community leadership and that seek to promote community self-determination. We don't need white people to fix us or save us. We don't need missionaries. We need leadership that grows organically from our communities. We have the responsibility of shifting the narrative about the food movement. We have to ask ourselves whose voices are heard and whose images are projected. Here are some extraordinary food movement leaders that you should know about. This is Jenga Mwendo, who leads the Backyard Gardeners Network in New Orleans. She lives in the Hurricane Katrina ravished Lower Ninth Ward. She's utilizing community gardening as a way to get her neighbors to envision what they want for their community and to work together to make it more beautiful and beneficial. <clears throat> Meet Cynthia Hayes, the executive director of SAFON, the Southeast African American Farmers Organic Network. She has organized more than 120 black organic farmers in the Southeast United States and recently began a Caribbean initiative based in the U.S. Virgin Islands to train farmers in the region to receive organic certification. <clears throat> this is my friend Alufami Lewis, who manages community guards in Asheville, North Carolina, is one of the founders of the Asheville Buncombe Food Policy Council, and is a tireless advocate for food justice. Finally, here's Detroit's own Jerry Ann Hebron, who directs the Oakland Avenue Farm, which produces a wide variety of fruits and vegetables that are grown in Detroit's North End neighborhood. She is also the vice chair of the Detroit Food po Policy Council and is a member of the board of Keep Growing Detroit. Food is a great unifier. Everybody eats. The movement has the potential to model the justice and equity that we desire in all aspects of society. This will require that white people humble themselves in order to learn from the rich cultural traditions of black, brown, red, and yellow people. It is my belief, it is my belief that the values embedded in the indigenous culture, cultural traditions of those peoples are what will be needed to pull us from the brink of disaster. Those active in the struggle for food security, food justice, and food sovereignty must work to dismantle the system of white supremacy if we are to create a food system in which access to high quality, fairly and sustainably grown clean food is upheld as a human right. The reality is that those issues are interconnected. Social justice is a prerequisite for food sovereignty. The great revolutionary thinker Franz Fanon in his classic book, The Wretched of the Earth, instructed us that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. This is our time. Let's act in a manner that makes future generations proud. Thank you, Bioneers. <laughs> <laughs>